to the next subsection of the rules. This subsection is transactions and communication with persons other than your clients. This subsection of the rules makes up 2 to 8% of your total MPRE examination. Turning to the first rule that I would like to cover here. This rule is all about our truthfulness in statements to others. Here the rule says that in the course of representing a client, a lawyer shall not knowingly, one, make a false statement of material fact or law to a third person. Let's just stop there. This means that a lawyer should, should not lie. It's that, it's that plain. Um, a lawyer shouldn't lie about the facts. A lawyer should not lie about the law. They shouldn't do this as it relates to anyone in the course of representing a client. The rule then goes on to say that in the course of representing a client, the lawyer shall not knowingly fail to disclose a material fact to a third person when disclosure is necessary to avoid assisting a criminal or fraudulent act by a client unless disclosure is prohibited by the rules of confidentiality. Um, so a few things here. First, this is saying is that you should not lie by omission. So while we know from the first part of this rule is that you're not supposed to lie by misrepresenting facts or the law, this part of the rule is saying that you should not forget or fail to disclose certain facts, um, especially if you know that they are relying on the information that you're giving them and you know uh, that they would like to know this information that you are, say, withholding or not being fully transparent about. This rule is also saying that when it comes to information that you have regarding your client's case, um, you have to disclose this type of information relating to representation if doing so would avoid assisting some sort of criminal or fraudulent act of your client. The only time you're not allowed to reveal this type of confidential information rela relating to your client's representation is if it would be prohibited by our duty of confidentiality. So the way I like to think of this rule is what it's essentially saying is that if there is an exception to confidentiality, which we know that there are six, if you have information that would be permissible for you to disclose pursuant to those six exceptions, then you must disclose it under this rule if disclosing it would help us avoid assisting a client in some sort of crime or fraud-like activity. I think of this rule as basically turning the may of confidentiality exceptions into a must if they're applicable. So turning to a quick example of this, it says a lawyer is assisting a client in the sale of a building. The building has asbestos and both the lawyer and the client know about this fact. Failure to disclose no asbestos is a crime in that jurisdiction. The lawyer does not correct the client's disclosure documents stating that there is no asbestos in the building. The lawyer would be subject to discipline for this. Uh, because obviously this information is confidential because it's in connection to the representation with a client. However, this is the type of information that must be disclosed to avoid assisting the client with a crime or fraud in which your services have been retained. Another uh, few facts or little tidbits of information to help you in understanding this rule. It's good to know that a misrepresentation can occur if a lawyer incorporates or affirms a statement of another person that the lawyer knows to be false. So lawyers have to be careful with that. Additionally, under generally accepted conventions of negotiation, certain types of statements ordinarily are not taken as statements of material fact, such as estimates of price or value placed on the subject matter of a transaction, a party's intentions to accept some sort of settlement of a claim, or the existence of an undisclosed principle, except when the non-disclosure of that principle would constitute fraud. So basically what this is saying is just remember that oftentimes uh, lawyers do involve in negotiation, uh, right? We try to settle claims. And not everything that we say while negotiating amounts to a statement of material fact. So keep that in mind in the context of this rule. The next rule I would like to talk about is communication with represented persons. So here the rule says, in representing a client, a lawyer shall not communicate about the subject of the representation with a person the lawyer knows to be represented by a lawyer in the matter, unless the lawyer has the consent 
of the other lawyer or is authorized to do so by law or by a court order. If a lawyer learns that a person with whom they're talking to is represented by a lawyer, the lawyer must immediately terminate communication with this person. This rule applies even though the represented person initiates or consents to the communication. And further, this rule does not prohibit communication with represented persons or employees or agents of such a person concerning matters outside the scope of representation. So this is a pretty loaded rule. Um, kind of at its basic level, the rule is saying if you are talking to someone that you know has a lawyer, um, or is being represented in the matter. You shouldn't be talking to that person directly. You should be talking to their lawyer. Then it goes on to tell us that this is true, even if that represented person is the one who's initiating contact with you. They could be calling your office or showing up at your office in an attempt to talk to you, but you still shouldn't talk to them. You should still be talking to their lawyer. The only time you should talk to represented people directly is if you have their clients, I'm sorry, their lawyer's consent, or you are doing so pursuant to law or court order. The rule also goes on to say, though, that this prohibition to communicate with people who are represented in a matter um, is only with respect to the representation. So, for instance, you could hold the door open for the adverse party and say, you know, good morning, isn't the weather beautiful, or something like that, because that has nothing to do with the representation. So keep that in mind. The next part of this rule discusses how that rule applies to organizations. Um, a lot of people tell me that they struggle with this rule, and if you find yourself struggling with this rule too, I think it's helpful to think of organizations here as corporations or entities under the law. Um, and you have to kind of take a step back and think about why this rule exists. This rule exists because when we're dealing with, say, a corporation or an organization, it is not one person. Right? When uh, person A is suing person B, we know who person B is and we know who person A is, right? So we know who you can and can't talk to. But when it comes to an organization or a corporation, they're not people. Instead, it's an entity ran by people. So how does this rule work in the context of these types of organizations and corporations? Who can and can't you talk to as a lawyer if the organization is being represented by a lawyer as well? So here the rule specifically says, in the case of a represented organization, this rule prohibits communications with one, a constituent of the organization who supervises, directs, or regularly consults with the organization's lawyer concerning the matter. I'll stop there. I just take this to mean um, if you are a person who is directing or supervisory, supervising or consulting the lawyer as it relates to the representation of this organization, uh, you probably have a lot of information and you have a lot of power and you are the type of person that we shouldn't be talking to directly and instead we should just be communicating with the organization's lawyer. The next part of the rule says the rule prohibits communications with um, the person that has the authority to obligate the organization with respect to the matter. So anyone whose actions could obligate the organization or the corporation uh, with regard to the matter in question, you shouldn't talk to them. And instead, you should be dealing with the organization's lawyer directly. And finally, this rule prohibits communications uh, with those whose actions or omissions in connection with the matter may be imputed to the organization for purposes of civil or criminal liability. So again, we're looking at someone within the organization whose actions could be problematic for this organization um, in the context of civil or criminal liability. So if there are someone whose actions could cause problems civilly or criminally for the organization, do not talk to them directly and instead you should be dealing with the organization's lawyer. It's also good to note that consent of the organization's lawyer is not required for communication with a former constituent. So if the fact pattern tells you that a corporation CEO has quit or been fired and is asking you whether or not the opposing party's attorney can speak to that former constituent, the answer is yes. And they can do that without consent from the corporation's lawyer. However, the lawyer needs to be very careful to make sure that they are not trying to violate the rights of the organization or corporation. Uh, so I just take that to mean that the lawyer should not ask you know, the former CEO to divulge information that was communicated between themselves and the corporation's lawyer, for instance.
And it's uh, good to note that this rule does not apply to represented persons communicating with one another. So to give you an example of this, let's say a husband and a wife were each represented by their own attorney in a bitter divorce action. While it's improper for the husband's attorney to talk to the wife without counsel, or vice versa, husband and wife are permitted to discuss the matter amongst themselves personally. That is totally permissible. The next rule here that I want to wrap up with is in regards to communication with unrepresented persons. So the rule says, in dealing on behalf of a client with a person who is not represented by counsel, a lawyer shall not state or imply that they are disinterested in the matter. So to take a step back from this rule, we know that um, if you are representing a client and the opposing party is not represented, we know that you have to talk to that unrepresented person directly. Uh, that's the only way in which the matter is going to be resolved. But you need to be careful in speaking to them and you need to be sure that you do not act disinterested in the matter. Because if you are representing a party in the matter, you are by definition very interested in the matter, and that should be made clear to the unrepresented party. The rule goes on to tell us that when a lawyer knows or reasonably should know that the unrepresented person misunderstands the lawyer's role in the matter, the lawyer shall make uh, reasonable efforts to correct that misunderstanding. I just take this to mean that the lawyer, um, if they come to find out that the person they're communicating with is confused about the lawyer's role in the matter, they should just simply remind them uh, who they are and who they're representing in the matter and that they are not that unrepresented person's lawyer specifically. And then finally, the rule says, the lawyer shall not give legal advice to an unrepresented person other than the advice to secure counsel. If the lawyer knows or reasonably should know that the interests of such a person are or have a reasonable possibility of being in conflict with the interests of the client. So this is a pretty loaded portion of the rule. So let's break it up. A lot of people think that when dealing with an unrepresented person, you have to tell them to get a lawyer. And that is not what this rule is saying. This rule is basically saying that if you're dealing with an unrepresented party and you know or you reasonably should know that their interests are in conflict with your own clients, you should be sure to tell them to get their own lawyer. That is what this is saying. It is also telling us that we just generally shouldn't give legal advice to people that are not our clients. But if you're going to give legal advice to someone that is not your client, give them the advice to go get a lawyer. So that wraps up this subsection of rules. I hope you found it helpful. Mm -hmm.